Hi and welcome back to Garden Ninja and it's time for July's garden update. So if you want some top tips as to what to do in your own gardens this month, come and join me. So come on, let's get cracking. So you may remember a video I did about crown lifting trees. Now a crown lift is a way to lift up the canopy of the tree to let in more light without necessarily having to remove the entire tree. So I gave you some examples, one of which is the um, tree behind me. But in this corner here, near the Borrowed View Moongate Garden, we've got another evergreen oak. It's put on loads of growth and now that I've cleared the others and I've started to develop this garden where I'll be over here, I realised I could really do with a bit of a crown lift on this and give it a bit of a, a nip and tuck to get it into a nicer shape. Now I've been underneath it, covered in dry leaves and I can see that it's got a really nice shape. I just need to lift a few of these lower branches and then I can tweak it into the shape of almost like a multi-stem tree. Whilst also giving you a sneak peek of the view into the other garden. So it's it's twofold. It's going to help the tree because it's going to neaten it up and allow airflow. And secondly, it's going to invite the visitor to explore further. So I'm going to show you that now with a bit of time lapse. So I've been growing tomatoes from seed in my greenhouse and I started them off probably around late March, April. Now tomatoes are a really easy fruit stroke vegetable to grow but they do take a while from seed. So if you've not got the time you can always go out and buy ready grown plug plants. But there's a few key tips with tomatoes to make sure that they don't just take over your entire greenhouse. And the first tip is to make sure that you follow the rule of six. So with most cordon tomatoes, the ones that grow up and send out side shoots, you want to keep them within six trusses. So the trusses are a layer of the stems that come out from the side. And when you get to six, you pinch out the top. And that means that all that energy gets focused on fruit rather than lots of leafy growth. A top tip is to make sure that you pinch out the growth in between the main stem and the side shoot because this will divert energy away from the fruit from each of those trusses. And I'm gonna show you that now. So you can just snap them off, but I prefer to use a sharp knife. And all you want to do is just nip that off. And then all... Now if you've watched my latest video design guide, you'll have seen I've been making a fire pit. And this is it. But because I've used a steel bowl and there's no drainage in it, it also doubles as an amazing water bowl. Now my wonderful husband has bought me this solar powered pump. And I think you'll agree that it really brings this to life. So if you've not seen that guide on the fire pit, go back and check it out. This is a real multifunctional focal point in the garden. It needs no power, no electrics, and you can take this inside in the winter months. But I think it adds a really nice zing to this focal point in the garden, and the noise of the trickling water is really relaxing. So Donna Henderson off Twitter has asked me a question about what's causing her powdery mildew on her mint. Now powdery mildew is a common plant complaint and even I have it in my garden. If you look down here at the scabious you'll see that the leaves have almost a grey or white covering. Now powdery mildew is caused by a couple of factors. One is dampness and two is stress. So if you've gone through a period of say a heat wave followed by damp weather that's kind of like prime conditions for powdery mildew to take over. Um, it will attack weakened plants. Now, it won't necessarily kill the plant, but it will lose some of the vigour. I've got powdery mildew on a rambling rose, which again has suffered, and it's just not flowered to the same extent that it would have done otherwise. So Donna, it's not going to kill your mint. Mint's a really tough plant. But what I would say is maybe move the mint, which I think looking at the photo, you've got either in a glass house or a cold frame, and move it somewhere out of that wind and rain and somewhere with a bit more of a consistent temperature. But don't panic too much. 
Next year, if you get more consistent weather, then the powdery mildew shouldn't be a problem. Now, Don on Facebook has asked a question about how you can create a mulch for ericaceous or acidic soil loving plants. And here's a top tip, and it's really easy. If you've got conifers, like this one behind me, that drop needles every year, you can see a load on the drive because I've been a bit lazy. But these needles, by their very nature, are acidic. So if you collect up enough of them, you can use them as a mulch for things like rhododendrons, blueberries and other acidic loving plants. You can even use them around hydrangeas to help change the colour of the flowers. So rather than brushing them up and throwing them away, collect them and simply mulch your garden with them and it will help raise the acidity of your soil. If you've got a specific garden design question or query like Don and Donna, then head over to my Patreon account and sign up. You can ask me anything about garden design and get a very tailored specific reply just for you. So if you've been following my videos so far this year, you'll know that I've been growing an awful lot of my own plants from seed. And most of those have gone into the wildflower meadow. However, I've also been growing some plants for awkward spaces, and these are known as my gap fillers. So if you've got borders that might be in, say, shade, awkward little skinny narrow strips, or places where other plants don't really thrive, I've grown a number of specimens that will pretty much tolerate any conditions. And one of those is this, and it's sorrel, known as the bloody dock. And a lot of people will consider this a weed, but it's actually an edible plant. You can eat the leaves and they taste really quite tart and acidic, but great in a salad. But these will pretty much tolerate most conditions. They don't mind a bit of damp, they don't mind some shade. Now, I've grown a full set of these from seed. I've probably got about 50. And what I'm going to do today is go down some of the borders where I've got shade and awkward spots and just use them just to fill those gaps. Because what I find is if you leave bare earth, no matter how barren, it will just accommodate weeds. So there's loads of little nooks and crannies around like the shed and down the drive. And I'm going to use these just to give a green foil to that space. So if you've got awkward areas, find a plant that will work well there, buy some seeds, grow a load of them, and then all of a sudden you can reduce your weeding and improve your garden at the same time. Brilliant! Now driveways and garden design are nearly always completely overlooked and it's a real shame because it's prime real estate for you to extend your garden and make the most of your green space. Now I've got quite a shady driveway but that does not stop me nor should it stop you. We're talking about gap fillers but we've got all these kind of quasi shade loving plants, we've got alcamilla which will just live pretty much anywhere, we've got primroses, we've got some luzula here but there's a few gaps so I'm going to use the sorrel and also the telomer to space out and fill some of these gaps because although the border is narrow by adding a bit more to it in different textures you can kind of give the illusion that there's a lot more going on than there is. Before I started this it was just compacted ground and if you're dealing with compacted ground guess what I've got a video guide on that so check back and look at that video guide to help you but in what two years we've suddenly got shrubs we've got this cornice here with a variegated leaf as I said, all these other plants growing quite happily, so you can definitely do it if you put your mind to it. Now the exploding atom garden has really come together this year and it's bursting with fire and drama. Now this central ring is the hot ring of the garden. And as you can see, we've got things like helenium, Rebecca, we've got Monada, Crocosmia, all of which have been grown from seed by me in the greenhouse without plastic. Now these are only two years old, but just look at how big and bulky they are, which really goes to show that if you want to get the best out of your garden and really understand your plants, then growing them from seed is completely viable. You can do it no matter what size garden you've got. And if you want to know how I've done all of this, check back on the Exploding Atom Garden video series on Gardening Without Plastic to find out more hints and tips from me the garden ninja. So it's been a really exciting month here at Garden Ninja HQ because the wildlife meadow is really coming into its own. Now last month I was planting out ooh, around 400 homegrown potted wildflower perennial meadow flowers. Ugh, what a mouthful. And if you want to know more of that, of course, you can check back on that wildflower planting guide. I've been mowing the path through the rest of the grass 
and all the different plants are being left to fend for themselves. And we've already got some really interesting specimens. We've got a bird foot trefoil that's already started to emerge and I haven't even planted it. If you want to find out more of this, check back on that wildlife garden design series where I'll give you loads more detail. But I think you'll agree that it's starting to really take shape. So that brings us to the end of the July update. If you like what I'm doing, why not check out my Patreon account, where you can subscribe for even more behind the scenes garden design tips and tricks. There's a link below in the description. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel where there are loads more garden design hints, tips and hacks. Thanks for watching.